You know, there are some book titles that'll catch you. This one really catches you. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Takeo Comfort Solutions. I don't know. Uh, I don't think there's anyone in this audience who's ever gone to school in an urban setting or a collegiate setting where there's any level of diversity that hasn't had this question cross their mind but most likely never saw it in print. Do we have the title of, of, of the book? Jess, welcome in on this Friday evening. It's great to have you. So if you're in a bookstore and you're walking by and you see this question, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? Don't tell me you don't stop. I mean, I, I, listen, if they're putting awards out for titles of books, <laughs> uh, this might be uh, an award winner. Can we break out to, to our guest here? There it is again. We have to do that to move the cameras. That's how it, the TV show works. Uh, Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum is president emerita from uh, Spelman College. Easy, easy, easy thing about it. Uh, it's a fascinating title. Thank you. The content must be, since it's this thick. And gotten thicker must in be this deep. 20th anniversary edition, yes. So, welcome. You were here in town. Listen, a dirty little secret that most of you Friday night viewers know, we taped the Friday show on Thursdays, and Thursday evening, um, Dr. Tatum was scheduled and did uh, appear at the Gordon School, correct? And correct. So you've got a, a community discussion going on yes. regarding this very question. That very question. Listen, uh, th these issues are fascinating to me, and I'm, th and I'm sure to the audience, so let's dig in. Uh, what's the answer to the question? Why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? When I wrote that book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race in 1997, I was trying to answer that question for the many teachers and oh, I school principals. This book principals. was written in 97? The first version. Oh, I see. This is the 20th anniversary edition. Gotcha. So I wrote a book in 1997 with that title, and I wrote it then because so many teachers and principals were asking me this question when I came to do workshops in their schools. 20 years later, people are still asking the question, but the, and the answer is yes, they are still sitting together. But the social context for why has changed in the last 20 years. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that. But why do they do it? Why do white kids do it? Why are Latino kids doing it? Why are Asian kids doing it? Why are kids separated in that way? It's because they're separated by neighborhoods. They're separated often by schools. When they come together, it's a natural thing to connect with people you feel most familiar with. The question really should be not why are they sitting together in the cafeteria, but what are we doing in the classroom to help young people learn how to connect across lines of difference? Because if they connect in the classroom, the cafeteria dynamic might change? It does. And a matter of fact, if you talk to young people, some of them will tell you it's not like that in my school. And if you ask the question, well, tell me more about your school, what you'll hear is that there's a lot of opportunity for kids who are coming to school from different neighborhoods to work together cooperatively, either in the classroom or in clubs after school, where they're getting to know each other, developing shared interests. and when leaders, school leaders, are really trying to build community across lines of difference, the, ca the cafeteria does look different. You know, di this diversity thing is, is the new buzzword. Um, and, you know, depending on the context that it's offered, I, I find it to be um, gratuitous and or substantial. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it moves for me, depending on the literal authentic authentic context sure. of the conversation now you know when I went to school uh, I just this I mean it, it always bothered me mm -hmm. it always bothered me that the, the number of uh, black kids who were at school were always hanging together uh, yet we had a pretty good rap with with a bunch of them in the dorms mm -hmm. but there would be this go-to and if you kind of you know crossed over nothing would happen but it was just kind of this like huh mm -hmm, type of thing um, uh, you know, I've been down to URI in the last couple of years, and I still see it, mm -hmm. yet there's a diversity even in our public institution, I think, that has really, really been healthy. <laughs> and now, 23rd, well, actually, I just got my college reunion notice, 35. 30. <laughs> uh, my kid just graduated from college. Which college? Uh, from yeah. URI. Mm -hmm. and, and she has a real non-starter perspective on race. Mm -hmm. I mean, very, very nonchalant about it, not really that worried about it, not mm -hmm. very focused on it. Mm -hmm. 
So if that has changed for the better, it's it changed in some ways. Certainly, this generation, your daughter's generation, is the most diverse Don't in care U.S. About history. Don't gay kids. I mean, they know the transgender kids. They're much, kids. They're they're much more no accepting. Issues. Much right. more accepting of the concept of difference. Right. But one of the things we know about your daughter's generation, the twenty-year-old of today, is that they've grown up in a time when the world has become more diverse. We hear more about not just differences in race, but as you said, religion, sexual orientation, et cetera. They're more familiar with the language, but they still are uncomfortable with the conversation. There was a survey done by MTV of 14 to 24 year olds a couple of years ago. And in that survey, they found that 94% of young people said that they had witnessed acts of bias, meaning they'd seen somebody being treated differently or unfairly because of their group membership. It might have been racial group membership, it could have been because of religion or sexual orientation. And yet, of that 94, almost all of them, right, had had that observation, only 20% of them said they felt comfortable talking about bias. 70 plus percent said it's better not to talk about it. Why are they uncomfortable? Why are adults uncomfortable? Everyone's uncomfortable, and I think it's because we learn from an early age these are issues that are potentially controversial, potentially causing conflict. But one of the things I talk about in my book is how can we begin to have these conversations in a way that leads to better problem solving. The basic observation is you can't solve a problem if you can't talk about it. And so the dialogue that I've been having with readers of my book across the country as I've been talking about it is really to help parents and children begin to have this conversation in a way that leads to improvement. Well, one of the things that's fascinating, um, this is such a, uh, an important conversation, it seems to me. One of the things I've found in terms of the power of, of, of persuasion is that asking questions is always more powerful than making statements. Mm -hmm. And, and think, listening carefully. Listening right, carefully. Right. So it, it seems to me maybe this makes sense, you tell me if it does, that if people have a difficulty asking, or engaging in the questions of race, and yeah. this, this, you know, they're big on diversity, but they don't want to talk about that kind of thing, mm -hmm. that the way you get in is by asking questions. Because mm -hmm. I think everybody right now is on pins and needles. Mm -hmm. uh, this new administration has changed a lot of dynamics. I want to get your, your take on that. Yeah. But asking a question is always, I think, a better way to get in than making a statement. Mm -hmm. And I bet you there are lots of questions that people across racial lines have for each other, right? And those questions... Am I correct about you that? You are absolutely right. And those questions start at a very young age. I'm going to give you an example from the book. So there's a chapter in the book about how to talk to young children about race. And one of those questions was a question that my son asked me when he was about three years old. He came home from preschool and he said, Mom, Tommy says my skin is brown because I drink chocolate milk. Is that true? Well, we know it's not true, right? As I said to him, it's I said, not true. it is not true. <laughs> I said to him, and I'll say to you, his skin is brown because your skin is brown because you have something in your skin called melanin. Everybody has some. The more you have, the browner your skin is. At your school, you are the kid with the most. He was happy with that answer, but the next day I went to school and asked his teacher, you know, this is coming up at home. What questions are coming up at school? And the teacher said to me, it's not coming up. Well, of course, I knew it was because it had come up in this conversation with my son. But I realized, too, that sometimes teachers don't hear every conversation. You know, kids are talking in the sandbox or on the, at the snack table. Not every conversation is in the teacher's earshot. And at the same time, I also know that sometimes parents do this. I've done it, I suppose. If you have a question you're not quite sure how to respond to, you might kind of tune it out hmm. or ignore it. Or let's imagine you're in a grocery store with a child, a three-year-old with a question, who says something like, Mommy, Mommy, why is that person so dark? You can imagine that that parent might respond with, shh, as opposed to mm. responding to the question, which is a natural observation of a preschool child. We know that kids have these questions, they ask them, but if you speak to an audience, as I did when I was visiting Roger Williams, uh, just on my trip to Providence here, 
I asked students to think of an early race-related memory that they had. Many people raised their hands. What age were you? Many people said four, five, six, seven. How many of you talked about it at the time that it happened? A lot of people said they didn't. Mm. They'd already learned at that young age they weren't supposed to mention it. Mm. There's a lot of silence in our society about these issues, and that's part of the problem. All right, we'll echo some of the contemporary matters of the day. Stay with us. I think there's blame on both sides. You look at you look at both sides. I think there's blame on both sides. What about the alt left that came charging at the, as you say, the alt right? Do they have any semblance of guilt? I've condemned many different groups, but not all of those people were neo-Nazis, believe me. Not all of those people were white supremacists by any stretch. Those people were also there because they wanted to protest the taking down of a statue, Robert E. Lee. So, so we, we've seen it all. And I, I hope there isn't a, well, there he goes, uh, throwing Trump into the conversation. But right now, listen, you've done some incredible work in your career well before Donald Trump was elected president. Absolutely. And so we're, we're, it, he does not stand as, um, I don't know, the new litmus test for race relations. But what? Leadership matters. You know, one of the things I talk about in my book is that we as human beings categorize. We categorize furniture, we categorize cars, we categorize people. That's the way our brains work. We think in categories. But we know that those us-them categories are not innate. When young people are growing up, they learn who is the us and who is the them. And the leadership, whether that's being exercised by leaders in the family, the parents, leaders in the school, their teachers, leaders in the nation, the president, um, who the leader defines as in our circle and who is out of our circle makes a difference. When the leader decides to say, it's just us, we have to worry about them, the people who are following that leader start to worry about the them and they exclude. When a leader says, we need to draw our tent broadly and include everyone because we want to have a welcoming society, people follow that example too. So leadership matters and the kind of example that leaders provide do help shape the narrative in ways that we might not always pay attention to, but we feel the result. Most 99.9% .9 of America is aghast over white supremacy in its, in its core. Um, but then there's shades of it. Sure, they're gradations. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's where I think a lot of the rubber meets the road. But there's also a constituency of, I think, well-meaning people who are either confused or upset about the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. um, frame that for me. Well, I write about that in the book as well. You know, when people, some people, when they hear that phrase, Black Lives Matter, hear it as not Black Lives Matter too, but hear it as only Black Lives Matter. But if you know it's that... It's a branding problem, seems to me. Well, it's, it is a question of how we listen to what people are saying. If you go back to the beginning, when did that phrase first erupt? I can tell you exactly when. It was after Trayvon Martin's shooting and the acquittal of George Zimmerman. And one of the women who is the founder of the Black Lives Matter movement wrote to her friends on Facebook how upset she was. And she said, hashtag Black Lives Matter. What she was saying is, our lives matter. I care about what's happening in my community. She wasn't writing, and white people don't matter. She wasn't writing, you know. Um, and so I think that we have to understand the context in which people use language, and also the way in which people's words get twisted in ways that they don't intend. This comes back to your point about listening carefully to people. If we understand why someone you know, I'm the mother of young black men. I worry about someone misreading them, stereotyping them when they're out on the street, um, even though they're well-educated, well-behaved young people. And so that anxiety within the African-American community, when so many shootings have been captured on cell phone video, we see what has been happening, is what inspires someone to say, black lives, as in our lives matter. I, I, I do think that, that well-meaning people just want this to get better and shut up. 
Well, you know, we just want to. Don't, don't, you know what I mean? Well, well-meaning people do want it to get yeah. better. But what you this well-meaning person up. will say is that in order for it to get better, we all have to take action and use our sphere of influence. You have a wide sphere of influence. I appreciate you inviting me here to talk about my book. But whether you're on television or just at home with your family leading an ordinary life, we all influence other people and can help shape the narrative by the actions we take to think more inclusively about who we include in our social networks and how we take action. And of course, you know, we've, we've had a, a pretty significant spike in racial conversation regarding the NFL. We'll talk about that when we come back. Stay with us. Okay, right, and uh, I have to discuss on the radio with the guy from Seekonk that's going to burn his jerseys, and everyone's burning their jerseys, and I'm not coming to the games anymore, and da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and when I ask the question, do you not want to know who these guys are? Just shut up and play. Uh, well, you know, there have been a couple Springsteen concerts that I've yelled, shut up and sing. That's probably after half a dozen beers. And the mm -hmm. truth is, is that I don't mind hearing what he has to say, even if his politics are different from mine. Sure. Um, it is amazing to me what America's going through with this NFL situation, which has seemingly simmered a little bit over the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. We play fantasy football. We spend thousands of our disposable income tailgating and investing psychologically yeah. in a sport. But when these guys decide to say something as people, we get all screwed up. Mm -hmm. Why? I don't know the answer to that question, but I will say that it's important for us to acknowledge that they have a right to say it. You know, they ha freedom of speech is an important Not value. Not there. Not with the anthem. The president said so. It, it, it's the veterans, it's the flag, it's the... It's none of that, actually. I mean, the president said so, but the president was wrong, in my opinion. If you ask Colin Kaepernick or other people why they're kneeling, they're not protesting the flag or veterans. They're protesting the unfair criminal justice system that they're witnessing. The shooting of unarmed black men is what Colin Kaepernick was protesting. Originally. Originally, and I think still. Well, I mean, I, well, the, the, the president the, the, said the, the, he's doing something different, but that was his framing, not Collins. Well, the, the, the video that we show there is actually the post-Trump intervention into this whole thing. Yeah. Where the conversation changed from what was civil justice and police relations with the community and him coming in, calling those who were protesting SOBs. Yes. And, and then it was like, wait a second now this is our unification statement against the president because the president has now characterized this particular message in a different way. Yes. Uh, and I think people get confused by that. By people do get confused. There's plenty which of is black players that were like, all right, Colin, you got a point of view, that's fine, but they were like this with the national anthem until yeah. Donald Trump pulled his stunt, then all of a sudden it was like this and kneeling for the national anthem. Right. Well, I don't. Th again, I don't think it's about kneeling about the national anthem is kneeling in solidarity with their teammates who have been attacked unfairly by the president. I, I think there are many athletes in the, in the National Football League, uh, many black athletes, who have, uh, I think, come to some level of reason to say, you know what, okay, we made that point then, but we don't have to die on that hill because there are other hills to make this point on. Do you agree? I certainly agree that there's multiple ways of protesting. There are multiple ways of expressing your point of view. What I would say to the people who are upset about Colin or anybody else kneeling, are you as equally upset about people dying? Because that's what they were protesting. They were protesting the unarmed, the murder of unarmed black men at the hands of police. Um, that is what launched the protest. And the question I would ask if someone were in dialogue with me about that is, how upset do you feel about that? Does that upset you? And if so, how do you want to express that? Let me ask you this. I, I, immigration is, is a big to-do right now. Uh, the, the president makes a big deal about it. And what seems to have gone almost unattended and uncured is the continuing need to work on relationship between black and white in this country. In other words, President President Obama exits, you know, by mm -hmm. statute, right? Yeah. Uh, we have an immigration thing, which is primarily uh, a Latino Hispanic situation and a Muslim situation, and you know, American 
black people and it, their relationship with American white people um, are, are, are just, uh, th that conversation stopped in the last 8, 10, 12 months in a way. Don't you think? Well, I mean, I, your visit is important. I'm not yeah. saying it stopped completely, but the no. momentum of the, anything that might have been going somewhere productively, I think, is kind of suspended. Well, I think there is a collective social anxiety in our society about the changing demographics. Let's just name that. And, you know, I was, I don't know when you were born, but I was born in 1954. 61. Okay, so in 1954, and maybe still true in 1961, the U.S. population was 90% white. In 2014, the U.S. population of school-age children was 50 percent children of color. That is a consequence of both legal immigration and also differential birth rates. That changing population makes some people feeling a little unsettled, I will have to say. Um, particularly white people will talk about the sense of the America they knew being different than the America of today growing up. But what I can say is that it's possible for us to have a context in which we all are welcoming one another, yet we haven't had it yet. I mean, it's, some, it's a goal to work toward. Immigration is one concern. You mentioned the president certainly has talked about immigration as a problem as it relates to the Latinx population, Latinos. But actually, if we look at immigration, it's not just coming from Latin America. It's coming from Asia. Immigration is coming from Africa. It's coming from a lot of places. Uh, I could talk to you all night. I got a strange question for you. Okay. It just dawns on me that anytime we have a sophisticated conversation on race, mm -hmm. that it is generated by a smart minority. Well, I don't remember on this show, on my uh -huh. radio show for all these years, I don't remember anybody with the resume that you have and the book that you've written who came here to talk about race, race who's white. Uh -huh. You only have a minute to respond to that, but well, what do you think? I think there are some really interesting books that smart white people have written about race, yeah. and I would urge well, you to invite me. them. Well, yeah. Yeah, but do you understand what yeah. I'm saying? I do understand what you're saying. Don't get a lot of that. Just like I don't get a lot of people on the Republican side around here to step up and defend the president because they hide in the shadows. Yeah. I don't think it's the same dynamic necessarily, but I have a hard time even, I don't think we even go to or have been influenced by or solicited by um, any level of brilliance from white experts on race. Yeah. Well, I think that's a really interesting question, and it does raise the question as to whether commentators, news people, respond the same way when a white person writes a book about race. But there are some, and I've cited quite a few in my, in yeah. my book. Well, we'll have to check up. Yeah. Um, uh, whenever you're in town, come back. I look forward to continuing this, this conversation. This is a book you've got to read. I know I will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Final word when we come back. All right, listen, uh, thank you to each and every one of you uh, veterans who have served this country. We didn't forget about Veterans Day this weekend, and nor should you. Uh, lots of uh, services, commemorations, uh, not necessarily celebrations, but certainly observances over the course of the weekend. And if you haven't been to one lately, it would be of, uh, I think, substantial uh, experience for you to do so. So think about that, and uh, we'll touch base on that on Monday as well. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching.